Now, the back panel of the gadget station is going to be made from a figured maple board. And what I'm actually going to do, see, because this is where the wires need to go through, so I have to come up with some sort of contraption to allow that to happen. What I decided to do, and this is the back panel that's going to, I believe this is going to be somewhere, maybe the middle shelf, uh, sits right over top of the shelf, and there's going to be a little hideaway. Okay, this strip of wood is going to be attached with, uh, with magnets, and we'll, we'll be able to pull it off, run the wires through, and then put this back in place. I also need to trim the leftover material off from here so that only the top of this will contact that little rabbit and the magnets will hold it in place. Now, slicing this little piece of wood out of here is a little bit tricky, and the reason we do it this way is because I want to make sure I maintain the grain continuity there. It's going to look a lot better than if I just made this cut and then made this piece out of another chunk of wood. Okay, so I uh, used the table saw to do this operation, and let me show you the setup. Now, because this cut, you know, you're removing a lot of material, it's kind of a dangerous cut. I have feather boards in place that give me absolute security as I go through this part of the cut. But once I get through here, I can't use a feather board behind the blade. So I've got to be really careful how I handle this. As I push it through, you can see the blade is here, and I've got about two and a half inches before I hit the top of the board. So I can, if I'm very careful about it, hook my thumb behind the workpiece and push it through. I just got to be careful not to do something stupid like this and put my thumb down here. And that is uh, probably one of the most common ways people wind up cutting themselves is by doing something like that. Now, another thing I want to point out here is the special blade that I'm going to use. It's a, made by a company called Final Cut, and it's a really interesting blade. I bought it because I really just wanted to try it for myself. I don't know anything about it. We've talked about it on Wood Talk online. Pop Woodworking did a blog post about it, and uh, Glenn Huey had some pretty decent things to say out about it. So I was just curious, is this even going to be something that's useful in my shop? The idea is that it sands as it cuts and gives you a really nice smooth finish cut. Very cool for, you know, a miter saw, things like that, but I don't really do that that often, so I wanted to see what, what I might be able to do with this guy on a table saw. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm figuring if I'm cutting this long, vertical, very tall cut, that's the kind of cut that notoriously leaves a ton of milling marks in your boards. So I figured something like this would be perfect. Now, I've got to tell you, though, I did make the cut using this. The great thing about it is the first, you know, three quarters of the cut looks gorgeous. It's nice and sanded and uh, perfect. But then that last half inch or so, basically whatever's left after the sandpaper cuts like a normal blade would have cut. So it's a little bit raised and there's some burning there. So I'm going to have to scrape and clean that away. Um, but I'm, I still think I'm vastly better off than if I had made that cut with my woodworker two blade. Um, so I'm pretty happy with it so far, but um, I will give a sort of full mini review of uh, my impressions of the blade as soon as I have some more time with it. You should notice that this is not your average cut. With so much of the blade exposed, the cut can be quite dangerous. So please, use the appropriate safety devices and exercise caution. And if you aren't comfortable making this cut, don't do it. With the blade lowered, the second cut releases the small strip. With just a little bit of scraping, I can get rid of the burn marks. So now just to bring you up to speed, here is an example of one of the back panel uh, pieces that's going to stretch from side to side. Uh, this would sit in a fixed position, and this is the piece that's going to be connected to it using the rare earth magnets. And having figured it out, I might split these into two sections. So there's a left, uh, a right one and a left one. I'm not sure yet, but I'll resolve that as I get more of the piece together. Now, speaking of which, what I really need to do at this point, we've got so many parts laying around. I've got legs, sides, tops, bottoms, uh, shelves now. It's very important that we start to think in terms of what can we pre-assemble so that you create essentially sub-assemblies that then make it so that you have less parts to work with. So one of those things, for instance, would be to take a side panel and two legs, okay, so that each side of the cabinet with the legs installed becomes a sub-assembly, and it's much easier to move things around. So in order to do that, we've got to do some sanding, and this may be the last opportunity I have, especially once there's a leg on each side of this board, sanding in here is going to be a real bear, so this really will be the last opportunity I have to get a nice uh, even sanding on this surface while it's nice and flat. So. 
Uh, that is what I'm going to do now, and then we'll glue everything up. Now here's a quick tip for you. A lot of times when sanding on a solid surface, any little dust particles or pieces of um, uh, wood that are on the surface can actually scratch the workpiece that's down on top of the table, which is bad news. You can sort of negate all of the sanding you just did. They sell router mats and a sort of plastic rubbery material that you could lay down. That works okay. The problem that I found though is the oils that are in there seem to leave a pattern on the workpiece, which to me is worse than what we had before. So uh, what I do, it's a very inexpensive solution. I actually just use bubble wrap. It cushions the workpiece, it holds it in place, and you could put as much pressure, as little pressure as you want. And so far, so good. I've been lucky. There hasn't been any oily residue on any of the bubble wrap that I've used. All right, here we go. Now, whenever I glue up something that has a loose tenon in it, and really, uh, the domino is more or less just a loose tenon, I like to save myself a little bit of hassle. I mean, it's, it's stressful enough when it comes time to getting these glue ups done to get everything in and in position um, before the glue starts to set. So I like to put my tenons in, at least one half of the uh, tenon into one of the pieces first. And uh, that'll save me time later. Okay, and then I'll take a paper towel and I will carefully wipe off that extra glue. And as soon as we start this, the pressure's on. This gets full coverage on the entire side. Okay, we'll attach the first side. I could use my parallel clamps on this, but I find that on a curved surface like this, it's really a pretty shallow curve. It's a lot easier just to use an F-style clamp like this because it's a very small single point of pressure. I find that it works a lot better on these curves. And this is where those dowels, biscuits, um, dominoes, whatever you use, this is where they're going to come in handy. Because if these joints aren't sitting flush, that's going to cause some problems later. We don't want to really alter the inside of this cabinet at this stage of the game. And for the most part, that is nice and flush. Now the key for getting this cabinet glued up and, and nice and square and even is to make sure that those side panels are equally distant from the bottom of the legs and that's what I use my square for. I had already glued up one of the sub-assemblies, took a measurement, made sure both sides were even so both legs were even on that one piece and then locked that measurement into my square and that's what I'm using here to make sure that this one is perfect as well. So when it's all said and done, there may be some unevenness that we have to contend with and we'll deal with that when the time comes, but at least now we've stacked the cards in our favor that this cabinet is gonna be as square and all four legs are gonna hit the ground at the same point, if we're lucky. Now, the other thing I'll point out is the glue squeeze out. We do not wanna let that dry completely. If you do, when you chip that stuff away, it's gonna pull wood fibers with it, which is just gonna make a mess, it's gonna be terrible. So I usually give it about 20 minutes to set. By that time it skins over and then we can use a, a chisel or a scraper to scrape away the glue. And maybe just, especially if you have the scraper in your hand, give it a, another scraper too, just to make sure you clear any of the uh, film that's on the surface. And that shouldn't be a problem for us later on when it comes time to finish. Now I've jumped ahead just a little bit and we've got a dry assembly going. You can see the shelves have already been cut and they're in place. It's just half inch Babinga stock uh, that's been milled down to the proper width and length to fit perfectly between, uh, between the two sides. The back panel uh, strips are also in place now and you can sort of see how this is gonna work. The strips that I cut earlier, the little skinny strips, are going to be basically cut in half. Uh, a little bit of extra material removed from the center and they will go into the rabbit and all the way into the groove on the side and sort of lock in place. And then this end is going to be held into that rabbit with a rare earth magnet. And this way just by finger you can go in and pull the, uh, the little strip out of the way, run your wires, 
There are some details there that I haven't worked out just yet, but that's really the gist of where this is going. Now, in addition to drilling for the magnets, which we'll do in a few minutes, I have to make sure that the top edge of each one of these strips is dead flat so that I can glue it to the surface above it. That's gonna give the shelves a little bit more support, keep them more stable over time, and kind of just really give the whole structure that much more support. And as I look through, I can see that there's a little bit of gap action here and there. So really, I guess these things were milled probably about a week ago, so there could be a little bit of movement there. And normally I would just take them right over to the jointer, give them a quick pass, flatten them out, call it a day. Problem is, this is figured maple, and heavily figured maple has a tendency to tear out, which means every time it hits one of those little beautiful uh, little grain pockets, it's going to pull out some material, and it's actually going to wind up looking worse than it does right now. So the only thing I can think to do is to use a hand tool. So uh, let's get our Neanderthal on. Now, to date, we haven't used a whole lot of hand tools on the show just because the work hasn't really called for it. Um, you've seen me use my saws and my block planes and chisels and things like that, but we haven't gotten much into the hand plane. So let me just quickly show you what this guy is. This is a number seven jointer plane. As you can see, it's got a huge base on it. Okay, that's 22 inches from front to back. Now the concept and the way it gets its name is because it's meant for joining boards. And this way with a huge sole like this, you're able to get a good reference surface. If you think of what our power jointer does, Turn this upside down and you kind of see the concept. Nice long bed on either side and you could run the board across the blade. So the more reference surface you have, the truer it's going to be. If you take something like a block plane and go across the surface, you can flatten it out to some extent, but you gotta be careful because if there's a dip in the middle, you know, that might be five or six inches in length, this could very well follow that dip. It's not really gonna take the high and the low spots out. Okay, so the great thing about this tool, especially on a very small workpiece like this, it really does all the work for you. Now the idea here is to keep the sole flat on the workpiece, and there's so much meat behind the blade here that the, the plane could very easily tilt backwards, so it's important to keep the pressure at the front so that it stays registered perfectly. Uh, and really the goal here is to balance it. We're on a thin workpiece, and uh, I could gang them up together and do two at once, but I'm just gonna do one at a time. A half inch is enough to work with. So I'm gonna very carefully make sure that the front stays down and the, uh, the plane stays balanced on the workpiece. And then really the weight of the plane is gonna do most of the work for us. Okay. And just a couple strokes is all it's gonna take. And that's it. Okay, full length shaving from one side to the other means you are done. Use a nice straight edge. And as soon as you get to the point that you can't see any light peeking through, you know you got it. Now at the drill press with a half inch Forstner bit, I can create the holes that we need to, uh, to put our magnets in here, okay? Half inch fits perfectly, just like that. Now I'm gonna use a high quality epoxy to glue the magnets into the little holes that we just created. Now, epoxy is really the best, uh, the best material to use for this because it's great at binding dissimilar materials like metal and wood. The problem is these little magnets are very shiny, they're very slick, and it's really not the ideal surface for any sort of adhesive to grab onto. So to create what is more or less known as a mechanical tooth, I'm gonna get a piece of 150 grit sandpaper and just rough up that surface. Now, I've got two of them here together. This is a, a pair. So since I know the other side is gonna be going into um, one of the smaller, skinnier pieces, I may as well rough that side up too while I'm here. Okay, so I'm gonna take one of the magnet pairs apart. Make sure the rough side is down. Dab of epoxy. And drop it in. Now it's gonna be pretty airtight. 
So you're going to have to force that down. Okay. Now as the epoxy sets, it's a good idea to put some pressure on there if you can. There could be some air bubbles stuck in there, so it's good to have a constant you know, force pulling down on it. The easiest way to do that is just to get your other magnet, put it on the back side, and essentially, it's kind of like clamping it. <laughs>